Mark Wortman, a uh, great author. Thanks. Thanks for being on the Quintana Show. Really appreciate having you here today. Um, uh, well, thank you, David. It's, it's yeah. great to be with you. you. You've done a lot of books, man. You've done 1941, Millionaire's Unit. Uh, the Siege of Atlanta, you and then know, hi, your your latest book, which actually is pretty interesting, Hyman Rickover, Engineer of Power. Um, that's that that's a really interesting book because I think most people now, if you said, "Hey, I got a great idea, I'm going to put a nuclear reactor in a tin can, and I'm going to surround it with people, and then put thousands of pounds of pressure on it." What do you think? Good idea? Yeah? Huh? Yeah. Like, right? I, I don't think we really think about it that way, right? Oh, and, uh, you know, put it on top of the ocean occasionally, uh, toss <laughs> 50 feet up into the air and... Uh, put it know. in busy ports. Yep, yep. Right. Exactly. You know. Who knew that, like, nuclear reactors in a tin can under thousands of pounds mm -hmm. of pressure would be, like, the preferred way to get our submarines around? But yeah. your yeah. your book on Hyman Rickover, you do a really great job, Engineer of Power. You do a really great job of, uh, of laying that out, man. Well, thank you. Yeah, he's... And, and he's he's an amazing character. What he pulled off, uh, nobody else could have done. And the fact that here we are, sixty plus years later, and there's never been a nuclear accident on any of these submarines or uh, right or carriers is unbelievable. You know what part of your book I like the best, and we're going to get to why we're here in a minute. But I want to make sure I talk about your latest book. Um, is the and you don't think about this, right? But someone has to test the shit out. <laughs> and like, right? So at some point they had to say, okay, well, let's see if it turns a propeller. And people are like, yeah, well, shouldn't we do this from like a couple of miles away? And he's like, no, like, let's stand right here. So he, once, once the thing got going, he had a rule that every shipyard that he had a submarine built at, the manager of the shipyard, the president or the president of the company had to go out on the sea trials. So basically the damn thing is gonna work or you're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, that's good, I like that. I like that. Yeah, the shipyard guy just can't go, hey, good enough for government work, right? He's gotta actually go out there. I like that. We should do that more often. I like the Rickover style, man. You know, I, I I read a book. I mean, I know a lot of people don't like this book, but I actually really like the book. It's called The 48 Laws of Power. Um, and yeah, it's, it's actually a really good book. I know a lot of people don't like it. I got into it because a lot of rappers liked it as ways in which they kind of learned, you know, management styles and um, but they use personalities from throughout history. Right. Um, and I you know what? They should add some of Rickover's personality into that book because the way this singular individual kind of like co-opted nuclear fission for the United States Navy was just it's it's a really good story and and I recommend it to everybody. Ad, you know, Admiral Hyman Rickover, Engineer Power. Thank you. So, thank well, you. Well yeah. done on that, man. Oh well, thank you. It was uh, it you know he's he was such a character that it was just pure fun to to research his life and to write about him. And, uh, you know, and his legacy right now, as we speak, there are more than 30 submarines patrolling around deep under the ocean with on nuclear power, with nuclear weapons aboard. And and it's all thanks to him and his legacy of of perfection. Um, again, we're going to get to the to the Chilean Chilean crime rings, but one one last thing I wanted to add is, like, you don't think about it, right? But before Rickover, submarines really were kind of just cruising around on the surface, running on diesel, you know? And so when people go, why do they have to run on nuclear? It's because, dude, there's no gas stations in the middle of the ocean. You have to figure out a fuel, right, that's going to continue to to go forward, like, like nuclear fission. So... Yeah. Well, submarines... Down. You know, before before nuclear power came along, submarines were basically surface ships that charged up batteries, and then they would, when they prepared for combat, they would dive with uh, uh, electric batteries, you know, an electric motor, mm -hmm. and they could just they could just tool along under the surface uh, at low power for maybe a day or two, or at high power for a matter of hours. 
So they were really, and this is why during World War II, the submarine services across the board, US, German, Japanese, British, uh, they all lost uh, sailors at a per capita rate higher than any other service branch. It's just ridiculously dangerous to be doing this. Yeah. And then, then Rick Over comes along and suddenly you can hang out under the water, uh, you know, virtually nonstop until your food runs out. Yeah, and really. That's what that's what stops, right? It's the food and the oxygen, correct? Well, no. Or, well, the oxygen yeah. continues to, uh, yeah, that's right. The oxygen goes. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, until until your your supplies are done. You can stay down there. Now they they uh, you know you don't want to be uh, trapped inside a tin can for uh, for more than a two or three months, which is a standard deployment. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's you know it's amazing. And then they you know they s circumnavigated the globe underwater. It's yeah. it's you know and nobody knew the submarine was there. Nobody knew it. You know so it's because yeah, they don't have to surface. Because they don't have to surface, because they uh, managed to keep these things quiet, mm -hmm. and um, you know it's uh, it's an extraordinary achievement. Uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, who was a nuclear submarine officer, said Rick Over was the greatest engineer in history, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we can question that, but uh, he's yeah, up there. He's up there. Yeah. Great book. Again, uh, Admiral Hyman Rickover, Engineer of Power. Great job. Even me, who a, a guy who that is so out of my lane, right? I'm, I'm kidding myself by even saying the words, you know, nuclear fission. Uh, even that's an act. Um, but really, really enjoyable and a, and a very compelling story. Yeah. Chilean crime rings, though. So I first found out about this a couple of years ago. Um, you know, I represent some city, a city in, in, in California and, and they were talking about how there were crime rings in, in the state that were just wreaking havoc on high wealth areas. Yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Whatever. And mm -hmm. I didn't believe them. And then I started paying attention and then actually people I knew, right. Were mm -hmm. hit by these guys. Yeah. And yeah. I looked more into it and I, uh, made some calls to people who were, um, uh, security professionals. Actually, I've talked to a couple of guys who are probably at the very, the very top of, of, of their league in security mm -hmm. professionals in the state of California. Mm -hmm. And they immediately said, oh yeah, Chilean crime ring. Oh yeah, man, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. They are, they are prevalent in the state of California. They're wreaking havoc in the state of California. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That's mm -hmm. a thing. And they're like, no, it is a real thing. And no one's talking about it. And I started doing research on it. And here's what I found. There are literally no stories on this. All The only news articles you see are local news articles. So you'll see plenty of stuff, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like, you know, Channel 10 out of Atlanta or Channel 4 out of Scottsdale or Channel 11 out, Channel 11 out of LA, right? They'll, mm -hmm. do, they'll do when someone is hit, yeah. they will say, Oh, you know, homes burglarized, made off with $150,000, looks like uh, crime tourists. And, um, but there's never been like some large stories, like, like on the cartels, right? Mm -hmm. Cartels are everywhere. Everybody talks about cartels. It's a, it's a part of our vocabulary. No mm -hmm. one talks about the Chilean crime rings. And the reason we say Chilean, and there's an actual reason why we say Chile, um, it's part of the problem. Um, but um, we're not just pulling a South American country right out of a hat here. Yeah. So, um, and I looked more into it and it looks like it's, it, there's a definite pattern. They hit, uh, they hit high wealth areas. Um, they're in and out, right? They come in, they go. Uh, mm -hmm. They usually go in through a second story window because they realize that most people don't wire the second story. Um, they go for bags, watches, cash, jewelry. That's it. Um, the stuff is immediately shipped back to Chile or wherever they're going to ship it to where the fence is. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and they also usually know all of the applicable laws, right. And, and practices of the local law enforcement. So they know how long it takes law enforcement, even if they do trip an alarm. What I've read and learned is that 
they already know the average response time in certain areas, right? And so they know that in some of these higher wealth areas, oh yeah, they got a dog, right? Oh, they got a maid and the maid comes in and she'll trip the alarm, mm -hmm. but they'll shut it off, right? And so they know that, oh yeah, we got 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so it's very, very calculated. I finally came upon a story that I found in Vanity Fair written by you. Yeah, you did, a, you did a story in Vanity Fair in February in which you finally shed some national light. Also, one of the things I wanted to add that they do is that they usually target high wealth areas, right? Because you can make a lot of money in one run. Secondly, because a lot of them are located next to golf courses, trails, for woods, or open spaces, right? And so it's easy access. How did you fall into this, Mark? I... Um I uh, did a story a little less than a year before that. I, I did another story for Vanity Fair. I write about, uh, just as in the case of somebody like Hyman Rickover, I write about people who do extraordinary, risk-taking, adventurous, and even world-changing things. Uh, and that includes criminals. I uh, did a story for Vanity Fair about a... Uh, a gang of thieves from Romania who broke into a warehouse in London, outside of Heathrow Airport in London, came through the roof, descended down. Somehow they knew how to beat sophisticated security systems. Somehow they knew that there were going to be rare books inside this warehouse. And they came in, spirited out, uh, three and a half million dollars worth of rare books back out the roof and disappeared into the night before before the police came. And turns out, uh, through a series of investigations, that uh, by, by the uh, London police, uh, London Metro Police, uh, that it was a gang of thieves out of Romania who were flying into London carrying out these warehouse burglaries, and then in a very sophisticated, precise way, shipping the stuff back through the Channel Tunnel, uh, back to Romania for fencing. And, you know, they would stolen this sort of bizarre uh, loot of, of super rare books. Well, after that story came out, I said, wow, isn't that interesting that people would steal in a different country and then return home uh, as a way to what they thought would be a way to avoid getting caught. And, you know, I said, I wonder, you know, it doesn't take uh, much more than common sense to realize that that might be an opportunity in a world where you can fly a jet somewhere and then, uh, you know, carry out a burglary and hop back on the jet and get back home. And so I started uh, just sort of doing, doing some searches. And lo and behold, I start seeing this pattern of specific, of what they call South American theft gangs or uh, Chilean tourist thieves in Southern California. So Southern California was getting blitzed. Canada, Australia, the Netherlands, the UK. Uh, Spain. And so I, I uh, was looking at this pattern and seeing that nobody was really picking up on it as a major story with sort of global implications. And so that kind of took me down, as you called it, a rabbit hole of, uh, you know, of who was doing this and why. Uh, and one of the things that I that I realized when I looked at uh, I was talking to some people in Australia who uh, had information about about thieves that had been caught there. Um, those same thieves had been a, one of those same thieves, uh, 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 a young woman had been arrested in L.A. for a similar crime and others had been arrested in Canada. And I realized, wow, they can. They can jump. They, you know, they get uh, arrested in the U.S. or they get arrested in Canada, and the next thing you know, they're in Australia. So that just got me rolling, saying, "Oh, this is this is pretty big. 
why is this, you know, where is this going? Where, you know, somebody's got to know something about this stuff. And that, that sort of led me to begin mm -hmm. to, to do some deeper digging. Do you want to talk about the impact that ESTA did have on the growth of, of this, of this burglary ring? So ESTA is a consortium basically of the 40 wealthiest countries in the world. Almost all of Europe, uh, United States, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, you know, so on, uh, with the idea that, you know, you want to come, you want to go visit one of these countries, you get a, a visa waiver. You don't have to go through a long application. It's, it's an electronic system. Uh, if you don't have a criminal record, uh, you can be on a plane the next day. And if you're doing business, you can go do your business, as you said. Um, but, it, Chile is somewhat unusual among the ESTA visa uh, nations in that there is a very uh, large uh, differential between the, the well-to-do and the poor. Uh, but there's also a tradition, if you want to call it that, of uh, families being involved in property crime. It's an interesting thing. In Chile, there's very little violent crime. You know, we have uh, in the United States, there's much more violent crime, but there is property crime there, significant property crime. And there has been uh, a sort of family tradition, they're called lanzas, of going uh, elsewhere to carry out property crime. So the once ESTA was in place, there began to be this flow of uh, a small number of Chileans who began to come to the U.S. You know, we have to remember, you're talking about about 210,000 uh, Chileans come to the United States every year. And some number of them, you know, there, I've, I've heard estimates everywhere from 100 to 1,000 come to be tourist thieves, you know, come here for this short visa. They know other Chileans who are here, or they are told where to go. They're set up and they go to work. They get fake papers so that if they get arrested, they don't get a criminal record. Uh, if, if they do get arrested, they know the American laws. That's right. And American laws say, you know, if you go into a house and you burglarize it, but you do it without weapons, and if nobody's home, uh, it is not a violent offense. So you can very quickly, uh, especially in areas where there are, uh, you know, potentially much more serious uh, uh, violent offenses going on, you can potentially get almost immediately bailed out and, you know, receive a, a low bail. And if you've given them uh, fake documents, mm -hmm. you, can, you can vamoose. Yeah, you got no priors. Yeah. Right? So you're, you're back on the road and you keep moving. So I was uh, talking to, uh, you know, uh, uh, the police, uh, the sheriff, uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff Department, um, uh, head of the uh, burglary robbery task force, who's been dealing with this plague down there. And he says, you know, you come here, you work every night, you do this for 40 days uh, before your tourist visa expires. He said, they don't hit million dollar houses, they hit $15 million houses. Right. And you you could take in $40,000 in a night in 20 minutes you, and you disappear into the darkness, you know, that's a lot of loot to haul away. Uh, I talked to people in uh, a couple in uh, Coral Gables, Florida, uh, who lost uh, over a million dollars worth of, of uh, valuables in, uh, they had cameras. They could see these people go off with their safe. You know, if you find a safe, this is like, uh, you know, uh, the, the pirates finding the pirates treasure, treasure chest. 
Yeah, they uh, they came in with bolt cutters, cut the you know a safe embedded to, into the floor. They beat a um, uh, a sound uh, a very sophisticated sound sensing alarm system, uh, and they were out uh, with the safe in under fifteen minutes, and it had over a million dollars worth of items in it. Yeah. Now then, you have to fence it. And that actually gets into some uh, more significant questions about, you mentioned cartels. So the question is, uh, is this a large scale criminal organization or is it word of mouth that goes back to Chile? Um, and I think there's, there are probably elements of both going on here. These people, as the ESTA program uh, continued, people began to see their neighbors in the, some of the poor areas of Santiago. Suddenly, they're driving really nice cars. They're we uh, wearing uh, designer clothing. They've got jewelry. They're starting to build nicer houses, you know, and then they learn, oh, you know, you went, you went to the U.S. or you went to the U.K., and in uh, a couple months, you came back with enough money to do that. Um, you know, I'm going to try my luck. The, there are many people in police forces that I've talked to, though, who think that there's something much more sophisticated than that going on, uh, that it involves a uh, there. Right now, there are police officials uh, who are uh, tracking and probably soon to make some major arrests of a small group uh, of, um, uh, of people who are also South Americans, uh, not necessarily from Chile, who are funding the operations, who are organizing the operations, who are bringing people in and shuttling them around and telling them, this is where you go. Yeah, that's so. That's Mark. What leads me to believe that this is probably, but you, honestly, you're the expert. I'm a dilettante here. But um, what leads me to believe that this might be a much larger global, um, or at least semi-global operation in that it takes an amazing amount of coordination, right? To find out what the neighborhoods are, right? They're, they're going to make sure that they hit Atherton, you know, Calabasas. They, they're making sure they hit the right places, right? With the 10 to $15 million homes, not the $1 million homes. They know the difference. And so there's a coordination there. Someone has to fund the plane tickets. Someone has to put these guys up in in hotels. And I don't mean guys, because there are women who have been caught also. So someone has to put these people up in hotels, right? Someone has to drive them around um, to those open spaces where they can then, you know, come up in the dark of night. So it does seem like there's an amazing amount of coordination. Further, the, the other thing that I find interesting, Mark, is that it looks like they probably co-opt people in the U.S., for the because they know from what I have read, they know the patterns of the, their targets because they like they don't like to rob people who are there, and it's almost always early evening, uh, never like you know rarely middle of the night, but usually early evening, and it's usually a, a home where no one is. Like they've left, they know when they go to dinner, they know when they're you know what I mean. They're going to the gym um, or whatever they you know whatever their patterns are. So it looks like there's also probably money going to scouts in the in the United States. Have you found any of that? There's certainly a good question uh, whether uh, there's. I talked to. Um, uh, somebody who's uh, now heading up a uh, Miami-Dade County uh, task force that's mm -hmm. dealing with the problem in, in, in the Miami region. Because it's, you know, it, any major me metropolitan area is going to be facing this. Uh, if it isn't already, uh, it will be. Um, and that uh, the person who's heading up that task force, who incidentally used to be uh, involved in dealing with the uh, drug cartels in Miami, and he says this is bigger than anything involving the cartels, although he says it's nowhere near as violent, of course. Uh, what he's seeing is information that's coming back saying, yes, they, that there are uh, sophisticated organizations that bring people in, that scout out locations that create these gangs and that move them about because these, you know, the gangs don't, they don't, they're typically cells of about four people. 
but they don't stay together. They move, they, uh, they break away and they join another cell. And so, you know, that again, requires a certain level of coordination. Who's, who's telling somebody who comes in, flies into Los Angeles, uh, meets up with three or four others, and then they go about do, uh, do a series of, of break-ins, and then they split apart and go and join, form up other cells. So that's, you know, how that can happen without some mastermind mm-hmm. who, who's setting up is, is hard to say. And then as, uh, you know, a, a detective who's been tracking um, uh, the person who ended up being the principal subject of my article for Vanity Fair, mm-hmm. who finally arrested him, uh, you know, he, he said, this guy came up through, um, uh, you know, went out to L.A., came up uh, through um, up the West Coast, across to Montana. He says, how the fuck does he know <laughs> that there are rich people in right. Montana? <laughs> you know? right. uh, one thing to know that, you know, uh, I live Beverly in, Hills, right? Everybody knows yeah, that Beverly one. Beverly Hills, Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, you know, we know that rich, anybody can, can figure out there, that there are rich people there. But how do you know that there are where rich people are in Tennessee and Wyoming um, and, uh, you know, North Carolina and South Carolina? Yeah. So we're talking about the Chilean burglary ring, which I believe is the world's largest criminal organization operation that no one even knows about. You know, I always like to, I have this phrase that I heard someone say once, and it was that it's the, it's the, uh, it's the whale that comes above the sea that gets harpooned. Right. And so, you know, the cartels, they can't help themselves. They love, they love to surface, right? It's the whale that surface that gets harpooned because they like the, they like everybody to see them, right? Hey, we're the big whale. Look at us, right? Now you got the harpoons. This is the whale that stays underwater. Like, like the submarines we were talking about earlier, right? They don't surface. And it's amazing with the amount of theft and the amount of damage to lives that they're doing around the United States and virtually no one is covering this. And so my next question is why, why, why aren't there more stories like yours? Why aren't there books? Be- why aren't there Netflix series about these Chilean burglary rings, man? Uh, there, I, I actually uh, have been talking with, with a, uh, uh, some people who've done some work for Netflix. Okay. So, you know, maybe one. <laughs> yeah. but that said, um, you know, it's exactly because they don't want to, uh, to be observed. They don't want to leave footprints. You know, if you're, if you're a narco, you want people to be afraid of you. You want songs written about you. You want, you yeah. want people to be terrified of what you can do to them. These guys want you not to even know they've been through your town. They want the locals the local police to think it's just a bunch of stupid shitheads coming in and, and they got lucky. They came into this house and they made off and they made off into the night with, uh, you know, a bunch of watches and a bunch of jewelry and handbags. And they also happened to nab, you know, $10,000 in cash. Well, then they begin to, the police begin to say, wow, they've come back again. And it's it's the same pattern. And that's that's really what started to reveal it was that it was happening in so many places and in such a similar fashion. But these guys they don't they don't leave footprints. They have fake IDs because they understand the American legal system uh, that can't track them and that doesn't uh, that releases them quite fast. In most cases, the guy I wrote my article about, he's looking at some serious federal charges now that are uh, that are going to uh, keep him in in prison for a long time to come. Um, If if you look, there was a story, uh, I think it was on Channel 11 in Los Angeles about uh, (laughs) the guys that robbed the jewelry store where they cut a hole in the ceiling. And they went in. So they, they I guess they are also doing some commercial activity, too. 
uh, or, uh, you know, I might get this wrong, but the cops caught a group of Chileans, right? And then they caught another Chilean. Um, they caught one Chilean with all the goods, right? And they caught the other guys in the car that were going to pick him up. So they caught the guy, five guys in the car, and they're like, hey, you know, you guys need to come with us, you know? And they're like, what, what, what? But because they couldn't tie him, them exactly to the other Chilean that they caught, they actually took him to Denny's because they couldn't. And the victim was like, are you freaking kidding me? The cops took them to Denny's like, uh, and they left right after that, they absconded. They're gone. Never to be seen again. Just like ghosts in the night. Are you seeing a lot of this move into the commercial or are they still kind of stand with, you know, are they dancing with the one that they brought? Yeah. Um, so my understanding is, uh, during COVID during the height of COVID because people were at home more mm -hmm. uh, that there was a great deal more uh, um, sort of opportunistic smash and grab. And then some of these uh, very sophisticated uh, entrances into uh, stores with high value goods that, that uh, jewelry store break in, in Los Angeles, they actually cut, figured out how to cut the power into the store so that the alarm wouldn't go off when they were in there. So, yeah. you know, there, there's, uh, uh, you know, just a, a real level of sophistication to some of these thieves. You know, in, um, in Canada, the, they had robbed, a group had robbed so many items they had to take uh, rent a commercial storage locker to store all their 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 loot in, uh, and in the UK, uh, uh, Premier League football players, soccer players, you know these super wealthy mm -hmm. soccer players were getting robbed while they were on the road to uh, for away games. They knew the schedule yeah. of. And there was a, you know, a specific area where all of, uh, where a lot of the um, football stars, soccer stars lived and they were hitting that area. And eventually uh, they realized the, um, the UK police uh, that there was a, a ring uh, that was, uh, I forget, I think it was about 60 people who were being shuttled in and out of every two weeks in and out of the UK. Oh my you know? God. They would come in. They have like shifts like a military. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, they, they, uh, they knew where to go, who to hit, mm -hmm. what they wanted, how to get what they wanted fast without setting off alarms and how to, and then how to fence it, mm -hmm. you know, and how to send it home. I found somebody who was intimately uh, associated with people involved in the Chilean uh, theft gangs, and this person, uh, and I can't, I can't reveal anything that sure. would identify him because he, yeah. as he said to me, it's very dangerous for me. He told me that uh, for high-end clothing items, they would have people without criminal records fly into the United States with empty suitcases or with no suitcases. Uh, they would wear multiple layers of, of clothing and fill their suitcases up with designer clothes and designer handbags and fly back to Chile. Somebody who in the Miami area, detective in the Miami area said, you know, you go to the uh, jewelry center down there. It's the center of uh stolen watches mm -hmm. you know so you could bring in a watch fence it quickly and uh you know as long as it couldn't be easily identified traced and identified with a a serial number uh okay. you know you can get your money and go and then cash you just go to western union and mm -hmm. and uh you can you can wire it home. You know, it really is. It's interesting because you know two of the big issues on the on our political plate are you know um, crime and immigration, and it seems like the Chilean these Chilean burglary rings are really kind of where those issues meet, right? 
huge hole, right? Huge hole in the immigration. Well, I'm not, not a hole, but it's one that's being exploited. And then you also have um, knowledge of the lax criminal laws in many, many states. So I was talking to, I was talking to the the, the gentleman who heads up. Again, he's at the very top of the the private security. Um, industry in California. And he was telling me, yeah, you know, David, these, these guys know the law. If they're approached by police, they know to throw, you know, their backpack into the bushes. And then the police have to prove that that was their backpack, right? Cause there's no identification in the backpack. Um, he's like, yeah, they'll, they, they just know the law. They know exactly what and what cannot be done. Um, and like you said earlier, these guys have all of these falsified IDs. So when they are taken and they know, right, they know that burglary in and of itself is not going to get you, right, you're not going to stay in jail in California. So they have no ID. So they have no priors. And so they're just let right out on the OR. So it really is this really interesting place where immigration and, and crime kind of come uh, to meet. You know, it's, it's of course, the the conundrum of globalization. When you globalize uh, the regular legitimate economy, you also globalize uh, the illegitimate economy. You create the possibility for uh, fentanyl to be shipped into the United States by the tons, you know, because it can be hidden inside trucks and inside airplanes that fly in uh, delivering what are believed to be normal, legitimate goods. And in the same way, uh, you create uh, a market for tourists. And who doesn't want tourists coming to the United States? Right. Who doesn't want commerce, international commerce? You know? But you also then create these holes that those with ill intent can slip through. And... You know, if if there was an easy answer, you know, people look for easy answers for this. I don't think there's there's an easy answer. You know, there are certainly laws that can be tightened up. Uh, the, one of the things that has been going on is the uh, the homeland security is and police are working more closely now with their Chilean counterparts to improve the Chilean surveillance uh, at their end of the ESTA program. So the, you know, the ESTA program depends on that the databases exist nationally so that you bring your passport and, and your airplane ticket and they can run it through and they can say, oh, you have a criminal record. You're, you know, mm -hmm. there's no way you're going into the United States. We're not going to waive the visa, uh, the visa requirements for you. Yeah, I was wondering about that. I was wondering if Chile would be at risk of losing their membership in the ESTA program if enough countries got together and said, hey, you need to tighten this up. Uh, God, you know, God bless you guys. We wish you well. We know you're doing well. You know, it's not your fault, but you had a lot of folks come to our countries. Uh, you, need to, you need to tighten up your, uh, your vetting. Um, you're saying that might be happening a little bit? I think, I think it is. I spoke with the... Um you know, the head of the Chilean National Police who uh, responsible for uh, for managing or for overseeing the effort to, to quell this. And, you know, he told me that their uh, previous uh, uh, database system was simply inadequate and that they they are upgrading. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, you know, you can have people uh, in the same way that people are walking across the borders, uh, you know, you can, you can fly into, uh, Mexico and come across a border and, you know, quickly get, get involved in, in, in a cell. Yeah. You know, that, I think that's the problem, Mark, is that it's tough to take something away once you've tasted it. Right. And so you can tighten up ESTA, but the bad guys now know, <laughs> Right. The bad guys, have, they know the sauce and, oh, those are the places. Those are the laws. OK, uh, I think even if we tighten up ESTA, I don't know. The, it seems like the cat's out of the bag a little bit on this. And I, I think we're going to need FBI involvement. Oh, the FBI is involved. The FBI, FBI is involved. Yeah. The FBI is very closed mouth about these things because it gets into um, uh, diplomatic issues. 
you know, because the U.S. doesn't want to alienate the Chileans. The Chileans do not want their reputations uh, besmirched. Uh, so there's, there's, you know, uh, they try to keep, that's part of the reason that it hasn't become bigger news. Um, but, uh, but the FBI is involved uh, more as a, an information clearinghouse, trying to get word out. You have to remember this, part of the reason that it can, that this operates is because it's not violent. It's not uh, there is no, uh, it, it rarely crosses the threshold that people say, oh, you know, this is, uh, you know, the, the theft of, of some of the great works of art of the world or, uh, or um, you know, like that, that theft that I reported on in, in, in London where they stole those, uh, all those books. You know, you have this, this, uh, these rare treasures, irreplaceable treasures. Uh, with you know millions and millions of dollars, it's there's no question that it represents the North South divide. In, you know that that uh, wealthy northern countries, uh, you could call this uh, a wealth transfer to <laughs> the poorer southern countries. Um, but at the same time, you come into the country, you don't rob them. <laughs> you don't you know don't come there. To rob, you can, you know, uh, we can all look at somebody else's uh, uh, wealth, greater wealth than us, but you don't rob them. And, um, but, uh, you know, but there's no question that that uh, that these are generally people who don't have and want to have. And in, you know, the guy I reported about in my Vanity Fair story, his trouble was. He came to love the life in the United States. Oh. Yeah. And that's what, that's what got him in trouble. Most of, these, most of these people come up to work. They work for their uh, 90 days, move around in the course of it. And then as soon as they start feeling the heat, they hop on an airplane and they head back home. Or they move to another country. This guy um, went, when he was young, younger, he went to Spain, which is where he started out in the, in, in the game, uh, spent, uh, got caught there, spent a year in jail, uh, came back, sent back to Chile, got, uh, came up to the United States, met a girl here. I was going to say he met a girl. <laughs> he met, you know, she was, uh, she was working at a strip club in Miami. Uh, I've seen photographs of her beautiful young woman. He loved the life. He got addicted to what you could buy when you're going out and robbing a house and picking up, you know, 10, 20, 30, $40,000 in a night. And in his case, uh, believed to have hit that house in Miami that where more than a million dollars was taken in one quick robbery. Jesus. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because they are very soldier-like. They're all the same size. They're all small, wiry guys. Mm -hmm. They all are almost always dressed alike from the pictures that you see in the media. Um, hoodies, <laughs> usually the hoodies are matching and, and with, with the same pants. And they come in in a very military-like fashion. They come in quietly, in the dark like ghosts, mm -hmm. get their job done, and they're gone. Yeah. Um, there's, there is quite the military element, which is another reason why I think there might be some sort of, you know, larger power behind this, yeah. but, uh, they are very, very disciplined. Hey, too bad about the guy, man. I, I was going to say, I bet he met a girl and the whole thing went South and <laughs> well, <laughs> I was right. And well, she got arrested with him. <laughs> oh, all right. They both went South. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, um, you know, I just, uh, learned that just today from uh, the detective who uh, brought his, that cell down uh, after a, uh, a long, long and uh, arduous, uh, uh, fascinating detective work, uh, that this guy who uh, has served time in New Jersey and then uh, served time in Connecticut, all for the same types of burglaries, uh, is going to serve some time in New York, and now he's been indicted on federal charges. So 
so he's he's facing some very serious trouble. So the federal government is taking this much more seriously, you know, because they they they're seeing uh, just as as I did and as you did that this is something much bigger and that it's uh, they're going to need to make some examples to say, you know, this is is not just. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a pickpocket, a breaking and, uh, you know, a, a quick smash and grab. This is something much bigger because when you tally up uh, these various gangs, cells working around the country uh, and doing it night after night after night, you know, you're talking about tens of millions of dollars uh, in, in, uh, in some that have been stolen from the United States. And that's not counting you know, what's going on in the UK, what's going on in the Netherlands, what's going on in Spain, what's going on in Canada, Australia. Mark, Mark, I think those are the ones that are reported because I can imagine a lot of people who are of wealth and means probably don't even report it because they just don't want it to be known, right? Yeah. Um, or well, they don't- they're, and they're, they're actually in, in the same manner that the uh, soccer stars in England were robbed. There have been uh, athletes and um, uh, Hollywood uh, types who have been robbed, uh, but that information about those have have been suppressed. Yeah, Just- right. I could see that. Well, Mark, this has been amazing. You've been I, I've really enjoyed talking to you. You've been great. It's been a horrible subject. It's actually an amazing subject, but you know the subject matter isn't so great. But I, I, it was really important for me to do this show because so little is out there. And again, what I believe is probably the largest criminal operation uh, globally right now. And no one is talking about it except for what I've read from you. Well, people are talking about it, but it's in two minute segments on the evening news. But you actually went in depth in your in your article in Vanity Fair. Yeah, well, well, thanks. It was uh you know, uh, it, it's made a little bit of a star out of the uh, detective who uh, that I uh, wrote about in the in the story. And you know, um, if uh, and thanks for talking about my new book. Um, yeah, you know, if, I'm in Rick over. Yeah, and if people want to learn more about about my work, they can go to uh, my website, which is markwortmanbooks.com. It's M A R C W O R T M A N books. Dot com. And you write about my favorite genre, which is historical, um, historical nonfiction. So you're you're right up my alley, man. Yeah, um, I, I write I write for general audiences um, and love to tell a good story. Part of you know certainly part of what caught me with the Chilean thieves was this is it's it's an amazing story. It's a sp- story with global implications, and yet it's you know just a few guys hitting one house after another. <laughs> You're, you're an amazing author. Great work with Admiral Hyman Rickover. Great work on the Chilean burglary ring. And thank you for being a guest today, Mark. All right, David. Thank you for having me. Hey, if you like what you hear, like and subscribe. It really means a lot. And we would love to have you coming back every week. Thank you. Just like witches at black masses. Evil minds at plot destruction. Sorcerer. Death construction